Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Grant Faulkner, author of The Art of Brevity, Crafting the Very Short Story. It's published by the University of New Mexico Press. It'll be released on the 15th. Grant's the executive director of National Novel Writing Month and the co-founder of 100 Word Story. His work has appeared in the Times, New York Times, Lit Hub, Writer's Digest, Tin House, and Superstition Review, which I would like to appear in, Knockwood. In addition to his first MFA, he says he feels he should have an MFA in novels about people doing nothing but walking around, which I actually do have. Um, Grant is also the executive director of the National Novel Writing Month. He's the co-founder of the Lit Journal 100 Word Story, and he's also co-founder of the Flash Fiction Collective. And his earlier works include All the Comforts Sin Can Provide, a collection of short stories, Fishers, uh, a collection of 100 word stories, and another nothing short of 100. He's also the co-host of the podcast, Right Mind It. So welcome, Grant. Thanks so much for coming by today. Absolutely. Thank you, Sam, for having me. So I guess we should keep this interview to 200 words. We each can shoot for it. I'll tell the story of uh, Kawabata, the Japanese novelist. He took his novel Snow Country, and towards the end of his life, well, actually before he committed suicide, he uh, he wrote gleanings uh, of from Snow Country. It was a 14-page version of the novel. So <laughs> if you're searching for the pure essence of this interview, we could, we could go for it. And I could edit it down. Just <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, well, going forward then, let's get Hemingway, even though he wasn't involved, out of the way. So okay. you tell me, you tell me, you tell us his, I can do it or you can do it. Just tell us his, the most famous flash fiction. Well, he's got the six word story, right? Assuming you're referring to that. And I, I kind of have it memorized for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Mm -hmm. um, but, or is it? Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Baby so, shoes. Yeah never worn for sale anyway one of those combinations of those phrases so yeah it's a beautiful it is a beautiful entree into writing um with brevity uh because the, the beautiful thing about that story is i've seen it interpreted uh innumerable ways you know and it, it speaks so much through the connotation of the story so the reader it's it, it, it makes the reader into a collaborator essentially and the reader is also creating the story and I think that that is what happens so much in flash fiction is you're you're drawing more from the reader than you are in longer works. And I think like if this begs um, the, the 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 metaphor that Hemingway is also famous for offering, and that's what I thought you were going to go go to, is that he he says that a short story or a good story should be like an iceberg, and an iceberg only the tip of it is above the water, like one eighth of it, as he puts it, and seven eighths of of the story is below the water and it's omitted so it's not present on the page but it's you can intuit it as a reader and then, and then he, he puts it as if 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 the on, only if the writer knows what that other seven eighths is so he kind of has this mysterious thing going on where what's beneath the water is on the surface but you have to read very closely yeah and you alluded to it because i always thought of it like sometimes think of it as like the writer is asking the reader a question and the reader is answering it it's like so with that one it's like okay it's a cinematic six word story because you can imagine the parents in the hospital the baby stillborn it's one situation and then them maybe getting divorced because of the tragedy and then the idea of putting the ad in the classified you can see it all and you can even see that they're dressed in the 30s it's so cinematic and yet and this is what your book is about it explains how this is done and also how I could do it or one of the people in my bookstore could do it. So, Absolutely. yeah, so I will tell you another way that I approach it and then I'll let you talk. It's one of, one of the best um, flash fiction pieces that I know of in my life is also my favorite poem by William Carlos Williams, which is so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. It's 14 words, mm -hmm. right? 
Yeah, no, that's exactly it. It's um, I was going to in my book, I mentioned Ezra Pound's, um, you know, station at a station, the metro station in Paris, his his two line poem that I can't recite right now. But but it speaks. It, it's evocative, right? They're they're both. I mean, these are poems, but they're kind of like stories, and they're and they're evocative because of the images that they use. And and then I think they're evocative because they do invite the reader in in a different way than something that's more detailed and more explained. And and that's kind of the thing. I mean, I love novels. I love big, long, messy novels. You know, all full of snarls and tangles and tangents and tributaries. Um, but but a novel, you know, really invites a lot of connective tissue and a lot of explanation. It's, it's kind of like a southwestern city that's just kind of expanding, expanding, expanding. There's no borders to it. Um, whereas flash fiction's much more, it, it 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 invites a different type of storytelling. So it invites you to to work with these connotations, to work with the hints that you put on the put on the page, to work with the evocative nature of a story. And so uh, it's just much different than a novel. There's some poets who are very upset with the fact that the poem is titled The Red Wheelbarrow because it wasn't, just like John Cage's piece. It's like the th they said the title destroys the poem because it isn't about that. And yeah. the thing about that is I read that, you know, he, he had met some guy who was a farmer and he really liked him and he wrote the poem about him and the wheelbarrow and all that. And I never looked at it that way. The way I looked at it was that basically in our lives, and you talk about this in, in the book when you talk about, oh, your epigraph, which we'll get to in a minute, the idea that the infinitesimal and the shadow of the infinitesimal is so important. So in that poem, I always think, okay, so much depends upon every little one of those things. You know, the glazing, the red, the chickens, the rainwater. It's all we have and it's the moment and he describes it all perfectly, but I don't think that's the way most people interpret it, but who cares, right? I love your phrase, the shadows of the infinitesimal. I don't know if that's yours or William Carlos Williams, but- No, it's I part think... of your uh, epigraph, I think. Close, close, I wrote it down. What? It... Yeah, okay, that's another thing. Oh, when you write so, book, yeah. yeah. Yeah, when you write a book, I always thought the epigraph is like flash fiction because you thought about it a lot, and the epigraph contains your whole book. In a way, it does. Yeah, uh, I, or I think it evokes the whole book. Yeah, it's an invitation. Um, yeah, so I think I think you know all, all these all these forms. I mean, that's exactly what it is. I think I think the the reason I focused on the shadow of the infinitesimal is that that we stories are in the shadows, you know, and 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 that brevity, the aesthetic of brevity. I think it's an invitation to to look for stories in different places and to recognize uh, some of the might be smaller stories, but I don't think they're any less significant because of their size. I think that's one thing interesting about flash fiction, too. And, you know, as Americans, we like big things. Um, and we always think of the great American novel as being this big thing. Um, but I'd like to relinquish that notion and and start thinking about how to look for for value in smaller things, I guess. And uh, that's that, that's been one enlightening moment for me in my writing career was 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 that recognition that, that some of the smaller things don't make it into the bigger stories, but they're equally as dramatic. Yeah, and I wouldn't say this other than the fact that you put it in the appendix towards the end when you have the excerpts from other people where he goes, we don't do this for money. <laughs> and I was thinking, yeah, being a bookseller, you really don't do that for money either. <laughs> yeah, none of us are making money. <laughs> Which is, uh, well, I don't know. It's like, what, what? who was it, Dorothy Parker, uh, who said, what, and you put it in there, brevity is the soul of lingerie. Well, so if brevity is indeed the soul of wit in flash fiction, doesn't the writer have to have wit before brevity can be the soul of it? You can't have some dumbass writing it and, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, that is true. We, uh, if, if you've got a dumbass writing it, it's probably going to be a dumbass story. Uh, so you do have to have some wit. But maybe the brevity, the lingerie, um, you know, Roland Barthes said it a different way. He said the, the sexiest part of the garment is where the garment gapes. And I think that that's a good metaphor. That's uh, Lingerie is a great metaphor, too. It's, it's, it's a flash fiction story. It is tantalizing in, in its way. It shows 
some things, but not all. It, it offers, offers like a kind of erotic glimpse into a story. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of different ways to think about it. Well, as opposed to gaping, one of the things you talk about in one of your epigraphs, not epigraphs, but the preludes to your chapters are all quotes as well, is this idea, yeah. of, the idea of constraints. And I thought about mm -hmm. it, you might thought about, wait a minute, constraints, that's like squeezing into a corset or binding of the feet, but it's not that yeah. at all. And I can't really explain it, so I'll let you explain it. Yeah, I think, you know, like, so I'll go back to 100 Word Story, the literary journal that I run. Uh, it's the perfect example of a constraint because every story has to be exactly 100 words. And so, um, which which makes it, as you mentioned earlier, earlier anyone can write 100 words, uh, but it's actually hard to write a very a, a good 100 word story. And and so it's not like a, you know, when I first started writing, I mean, that's, that was sort of my official entree into flash fiction. A friend of mine, Paul Strom, wrote the book, uh, Jack, a collection of 100, 100 word stories that he offered as a, as a memoir. And when I first read those, each story was like a snapshot. It was like a Kodak carousel where somebody was pressing the, 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 the carousel and there'd be a new snapshot from his life there. And each one was a hundred word story. And so I started writing them and my initial ones uh, were like, you know, I might get them down to 150 words or so. And I, I told him, yeah, I wrote, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm writing these really short stories, 150 words. And he was he said, no, 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 you got to keep editing them. You got to get them down to exactly 100 words. And what you'll find is that you get a better story. Um, and he was right. And, and the reason he was right is that in taking them from 150 to 100, it wasn't like 100 is a magic number. It could have been 99 or 101. The, the main principle is, is that by writing with constraints, it was, it was forcing me to have a different type of creativity or inviting me to have a different type of creativity. And so I had to really pay attention to each word, each sentence. I had to pay attention to, to a lot of the things that you pay attention to, to the story, right? Like rhythm and mood and images. Uh, but it just was an, a more intense, um, I guess, I, I guess, focus. And that's why the story got better the more I thought about how to get it to 100 words. And I kind of think of it as a Rubik's Cube, you know? You'd shift one side and go up to 107 words, and then you'd edit those, start editing it down, and you'd get back to 98 words, you know, so it's a lot of back and forth. And that's sort of the beauty of editing anything is a lot, you, you, you go through a lot of back and forth with words and sentences in the story and what's omitted. Um, so I think that's how like a constraint works. You know, if you think about it in poetry, think of a haiku or a sonnet or a villanelle, they all, all, they all work with different rules. And those rules, um, you know, are constraints. So every, every story in flash fiction, it's, it, it's in a different container. And so just, just for your listeners, if they don't know what flash fiction is, it, flash fiction is a story that's a thousand words or fewer. But it's interesting that within that flash fiction there are all these subgenres of flash fiction you know there's microfiction which is 400 words or less or like 100 word stories or like six word memoirs as you mentioned and so these are all these different sizes of containers or constraints and you have to work within those containers and i find that you get a, a in different and a interesting type of creativity as a result yeah, I've always, <clears throat> of course, obviously, you know, all the people I'm going to think of, but they're always, when I see the books come in, like Lydia Davis, and, yeah. you know, it was a big, it's a thick, thick book, but it's not <laughs> a thick book. There's just lots of really great stuff in it that's very short. And um, and then you think of O. Henry or Saki, um, the one with the hunters. But, but anyway, yeah, it's like, or what if you'd like parse it down to say even jokes, like, why did the chicken cross the road? There's the question. That's like flash fiction, right? It's a form of it, yeah. Some uh, a, a reader, did, um, a reader. I think I think the reader was joking, but but she was um, mentioning that it was a, too bad that my book didn't cover jokes and riddles um, because they are a form of flash fiction in their way. They tell a story in a very brief amount of time. Um, yeah, and if you look at comedians like sets you know like usually a comedian um does a um their their bit is like a five minute set it was a type of flash fiction as well yeah like kenny youngman take my wife please <laughs> yeah um or even which came first the chicken or the egg to bring chickens back into it I, the reason i say that is because it make because people have been thinking about that 
ever since the, the first time I saw it written. I think the thinking process is, as I said earlier, the, the idea of you leave your story and then the writer's gone. And then the reader is like, all day long, he's thinking about it. Isn't that what you mm -hmm. mean? That's what every writer wants to do, I think. Absolutely, yeah. And I was going to say, just going back to your form of what came first, the chicken or the egg or a or knock-knock joke, like that's a, you know, a form that we're very, you know, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of a cliche of a joke, right? Um, but, but with flash fiction, you can take that form or that container and work with it and do something surprising with it. Like, like I mentioned this in my book, but like the author Kim McGowan, she took the form of a Mad Lib, which is a well-known form of storytelling, and then she made a story out of a Mad Lib, you know, and so I think that that's what flash fiction does too. There are all these, you know, small things that you can use in life um, and kind of if you're inventive and curious and creative, you can you can kind of change them and then make make them into a meaningful story. And the one you give as an example, and he's obviously one of my favorite authors, is Neil Gaiman's um, questionnaire, or, you know, interview by the detective, which is amazing. Yeah, every answer takes you down a different path, and you're constantly trying to put together the answer to what is going on. Yeah, it's interesting how uh, flash fiction, I, I mentioned this in a chapter also, how, you know, it's small by word count, but not necessarily by meaning. And Borges is a master of that too, doing essentially what you said the Neil Gaiman story is, is that he uses, he takes a story, story form and lets it be expansive. So you're seeing this big, complicated world, but doing it only through like a two-page story. So um, it's interesting how you can think about and in part of what the reason Borges did that is that he's interested, he, he, he knew he wasn't going to write, be able to write all the big novels that he had conjured. And so like, why spend 10 years writing a thousand page novel if you can think of an, a really inventive way to do it in two pages. So he might do, for instance, write, write the book review of that 10,000 page novel. And that might be a way for him to, to deliver that novel through the connotations or deliver it in a different world, way. And so I think flash fiction invites us to, to do that. Like we can still write big stories. We just can do them in, in different, shorter forms. I always felt that way about <clears throat> Kafka's Metamorphosis because I think it's 30,000 words. And I always thought of it kind of as flash fiction. And then I realized that the first sentence, you know, Gregor Samsa woke from troubled dreams to find himself transformed in his bed into a giant cockroach. That's the whole thing. It could just stop there. <laughs> You're right. Yes, yeah, the dramatic situation. Yeah, and you can't, there's no good, there's no good that can come of it. <laughs> yeah. All the new translations, they don't say cockroach, they say vermin. And he was obviously a cockroach. You know, he's on his back on his carapace and he has, this is where I go off again. So stop. <laughs> We're trying to sell your go book. For it, yeah. I'm just <laughs> um, then when you talk about constraints, then there's also this concept of expanse in a way, because you talk about John Cage's uh, composition which is, yeah. I'll tell you what I thought. It's 433, mm -hmm. and it's four minutes and 33 seconds of a guy just sitting at a piano. I thought it should have been called 434. Why is that? Because then there's the second after nothing happens, which nothing is still going to happen. So then it's back yeah. to you in the last second. Anyway. Yeah. Or the or the white, who did white paintings? Rothko? I forgot who was the, just... The white canvas. Uh, yeah, there have been a number of painters who, who've done that. Um, I, in, um, I think Rauschenberg uh, did that as well. Yeah, so working with with emptiness or white space, uh, with the premise being that you, there is no emptiness, right? There's always something that happens. And John Cage song you're referencing it, just in case um, viewers yeah. or listeners don't know it. Um, yeah, so he he actually did present a composition have a person come out to play the crowd was expecting the the song to play and then the pianist sat there for four minutes and 33 seconds which is the title of the song but the, the, it's an experiment with emptiness or silence and how there can't be silence there can't be emptiness because what it makes you do if you're in the audience is sit and actually listen and actually listen maybe more attentively than you actually might to the song because you're an anticipating and so you're hearing all of the rustling feet 
or the sounds that are outside the room, whatever it is, there are sounds. And so John, John Cage, who appreciated the kind of randomness of the universe, um, that was a song to him were all those just random little sounds. And so what it, the premise was is also the, the people in their seats were creating a song themselves by, by hearing all those little sounds. And so the reason that applies to flash fiction is that flash fiction also kind of works with spaces of emptiness and white space, much like poems actually. And so, and so there are, so you are, so, so creating um, a, a piece of flash fiction isn't only like about paragraph blocks. Sometimes it is about like almost developing a collage and, and you, yeah. there are different forms that a story can take. Yeah, and you dwell and some of your, uh, the authors you quote, basically you're talking about once you establish a context or a picture frame, then whatever's inside of it, I think I think William Soroyan said something like, uh, "Art is anything looked at with particularity." Mm. And like, I'll be driving down the street, stop at a red light, and I look in the median, and there's a tiny little piece of glass. And if you look at it long enough, you realize the beauty in it. It's just laying there with all the other stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. In another interview, I was asked if you know. Um, like your piece of glass, you know, if you if a found text, like Lydia Davis, actually, in one of the books that you referred to, she talks about discovering really peculiar sentences, like in a in a spam email, um, and she'll get obsessed by those. And so she'll take some of those sentences out as if they're like a found object. And sometimes they might be a story into themselves, or sometimes they'll be so peculiar that there will be a prompt for her to write a story around that and I do the same thing I find I find that sometimes like it because of the aesthetic of brevity I'll notice that piece of glass that you noticed and notice the beauty of it and but it will be text obviously so the piece of glass is a metaphor but I think there's so much interesting text around us and so many interesting stories that if we lift those up and kind of recontextualize them you know in a story they become their own their own kind of special art yeah, and it's like um, like Ulysses. I mean, James Joyce and Ulysses. The Nighttown episode is basically him sitting at a bar writing down things that people were saying. And it's so easy now because you go to the airport and you're sitting in the lounge or the gate, and there's people talking to themselves because they're talking with their AirPod in, and they're talking about their entire life, exposing it to the entire world. Sometimes I'll just sit there and jot down what they're saying. And then maybe embellish it. And you realize this is fascinating. Sometimes it's idiotic, but it's still fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I think we live in a world of fragments. And again, that's why I think like it's interesting to like think about capturing those fragments um, and, and making them into stories. Um, and that's what I think the aesthetic of brevity kind of is an invitation to do. You think the universe is fragmentary? Is it? Yeah, I think I think it is. I think I think that's what we're experiencing, especially in our lives these days with with technology. We have um, much more kind of splintered attention, um, the, the the simultaneity of our lives. You know, like we're we're right now. I'm I'm in this co working space in the ferry building in San Francisco, and I'm talking to you. And you know, I've had a day of work, and you know, there there's just different so many different layers, and I've been a bunch of all, all in contact with all sorts of people on the internet doing all sorts of things. So there's all these like different layers to our existence. And so they are fragmentary and they are intersecting. And I think like flash flash friction can help either isolate a moment of a fragment or or kind of like be have a way for like a fragment to speak to the other fragments that are happening. You know, um, Irving Howe, and this was like a, a while ago, you know, when flash fiction was just being defined back in the 50s. Um, I'm forgetting the name, the title of the book that he wrote this in, but he said that like these short shorts, flash fiction were like an epiphany torn away from its context. So it's one intense moment, you know, if you think of the epiphany of a short story, one intense moment, but you've isolated it and you've dramatized it. Um, and then you've you've put that like, space around it you know this, this either the space the john cage composition or the space of of the emission that that hemingway spoke about yeah and um that reminds me that you you talk a little bit about semiotics and you know i always think of umberto eco and um 
I thought about like in the old days, if you were staying at a hotel in New York, you would hail a cab by simply holding your hand up. All you do is hold your hand up and a cab knows what you want. Taxi driver comes by, stops, and you get in and you say Penn Station. And that's it. Yeah. He stops. Two, two words and one gesture. Now, if you get a cab, you get in, you don't say anything because, or not a cab, an Uber. You've already summoned him and told him where you're going. So you get in. He could be friendly or not, but he's not necessary. It's just, he had, but he has no idea where Penn Station is. None. <laughs> he's directed. To yeah. Penn Types it in the GPS, huh? Yeah. It's strange. Um, mm -hmm. In the moments of epiphany are, I think, the core of the creative force that brings out flash fiction. I remember I was, when I lived in Florida, I picked up a chameleon once. And it opened its mouth and a spider came out. No, it was like this incredible moment of epiphany for me. It's stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know? It's miraculous, but for no particular reason. No Life can be that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can write that story. That's your story prompt. I know. Right. Well, right about that cool. moment. That's, that's the other cool thing about your book is that because of your book, not that I didn't write before, but yeah, I've written a lot of flash fiction. It probably sucks, but you can't write good flash fiction unless you write. And uh, yeah, Absolutely. so I think I think it really has. Um, yeah, I wrote one called. Uh, it was a sixth order. I wrote a, one called Post Apocalyptic, and the story was: I thought this was all supposed to be over. I thought this was all over. I mm -hmm. thought this was all no. Yeah, something like that. Because post, it can't be post-apocalyptic. That's the end. <laughs> You're right. That's a good one. I like um, it. <laughs> uh, so what you are, first of all, so the book is not a long book, but it's not flash fiction. And it's an explanation and a primer and a lecture and a narrative and a class so what gave rise to it and what was your purpose for the what was your purpose for me in writing this yeah it's interesting though all the words you listed i, I think they are it's not like they're inaccurate but i really thought of it the book as a meditation and a reflection um and so for me uh you know i've been working in this medium of of short short, short fiction for a long time and so I really just wanted to articulate uh, the aesthetic of, about, of, of that work and that art. And also, I think an aesthetic is an extension, existential position in life. You know, sometimes we think of aesthetic as just being on the surface. Um, but I think of an aesthetic as being much more deep than that. And that's why when I, I talk about this a lot in the book, how the aesthetic of brevity of flash fiction opens up a different type of storytelling. It opens up different windows, both into yourself as a person, but also onto the world. And it allows for different stories to be told. And so that's why it's an existential position. And I talk about a lot of different authors within that um, lens of, of what different types of stories, you know, like the flash fiction, it's, it's about the nooks and crannies of life. It's all about also about what's in between what doesn't get said, what doesn't get recognized. Um, so, so it holds all these kind of different mysteries. And, and that's what I really wanted to, to delve into and really meditate and reflection or, and articulate um, how, it, how it all works, but also like the, how, how, you know, to what its higher purpose is, you know, how it, how it, how it is, is a very interesting way to approach life and art. Um, and celebrate it, really celebrate it and explain it. You know, flash fiction has kind of existed in the margins of the of the writing world. It had, you know, like again, like I said, we 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 tend to celebrate things that are big, and so it's always kind of it's been, you know, kind of I think not not validated in in the way that other longer things are. You know, both institutionally in academic settings and certainly in publishing settings. You know, publishers don't love, they don't they don't want to publish many collections of flash fiction, uh, at least not the big five. And so, but, but I think, um, you know, I see it, it's a trend that's happening, actually. More and more readers are, are interested in, in short stuff, and more and more writers are interested in writing it, especially younger writers. 
Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give give voice to what this is all about, and yeah, offer my reflections and my meditation on it. But that does, like you said, kind of there. It can, it does, it is also has have the purpose to be put in an academic setting or in a classroom because each chapter also has exercises to to help people write and help to help teach teach. Yeah, and the the last chapter, if you will, has a lot of basically advice and. Are you talking about all the quotations? Yeah. 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 So one chapter is, I mean, I kind of have a postscript where I, I love quotations from writers uh, or people in general, but especially writers on writing. And so I, I gathered together um, just a whole, whole bunch of quotations on different subjects, you know, that are within the flash fiction realm. And yeah, I like that one too. It's kind of like a quick way to, to almost read the book. Yeah, and also, uh, I thought the book was over, and I look at the appendix. That's probably the most meditative paragraph in the book. Now, which one? Which appendix are you talking about? Oh, now I got to find it. Well, it's the last page. Yep. Oh, you should show the, hold the book up. Do you have it in front of you? I do not have it. No. Can you hold it up? I don't know. I'll have is the proof. I have the PDF. Oh, you've only got it on. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't bring it today. I'm, I'm bad at this. I always forget my books. Yeah. If you're an author and getting in, interviewed, I would suggest. But I, but I think you're talking about gleanings, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you remember at the beginning of this uh, conversation, I talked about Kawabata's gleanings from Snow Country, where right. he took his celebrated novel that he won a Nobel Prize for and wrote it into 14 pages because I think he was just obsessed with finding the essence of that novel. The 14 pages weren't a summary of it. It was a whole different story, but he was obsessed with finding the essence. And so I thought it'd be interesting to do the same thing with this book. You know, I've written about 50,000 words on the aesthetic of brevity, but what if I captured it all in just 100 words? And so that's why I offered that in the appendix. It's like yeah. gleanings of the art of brevity. Yeah. So if you were playing devil's advocate with regard to flash fiction, so like when I go to the Louvre, I could look at the folds and the garments in the sculpture for a week, just the folds. Mm -hmm. And then, so someone else would say, well, look at Jackson Pollock, he just did this. So you compare that to Michael, compare that to David. And some people will say, well, yeah, flash fiction, you know, just write five words and you're done, or 10 words or a hundred words or a thousand words. Whereas Faulkner, like you were saying, big, messy novels. And they would say, well, this guy, Faulkner, is really, really working hard, sweating, sure. as sure. did Michelangelo, whereas Jackson Pollock is just standing above something, throwing things. Like, like you said, when is he done? You know, you know, when is the novel done when you, when you stop writing? <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, so what do you think about that? How do you argue against that? If you do, have you encountered that? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think they're really comparable in a way. I mean, when you mentioned the William Carlos Williams poem, a classic poem, uh, to write a simple poem like that and actually have it work is really, really difficult. It takes a lot of practice, a lot of mastery. It looks easy, right? That's what they always say, like the, the so much of the writer's work is to make it look easy. Uh, but a lot of hard work goes into that. So to compare like a Moby Dick to um, a great imagistic poem uh, well, one, I don't know that they're comparable, but two, I think it's just a different way of telling a story. And and that's what's so great is that we have all these different forms. They don't have to compete against each other. Like Moby Dick doesn't have to compete against a haiku. Uh, a haiku can be uh, just a different way to experience the world and express it. Uh, but it's equally as valid as Moby Dick. So I wouldn't place one over the other as an artistic form uh, just because of the time it took or the exertion. I think exertion, since you're if you're if you're ranking work of works of art by the, the amount of hours that went into it or the exertion, I would say that you know you might be surprised at the amount of exertion that goes into the, the haiku that we we need in life just as much. So yeah, I just don't think of it like that. I think of it as like celebrating all these different forms because they all have different ways for us to understand and see life. I interviewed uh, Paul Harding the other day who wrote Tinker's. I love Paul. Paul. Yeah, he's a great guy, and he's so much fun. Um, and he just wrote a new book, Malaga. I, think, I don't know if it's called Malaga. No, Another Beauty or something like that. It's really good. And yeah. um, so he was saying, you know, he doesn't care about plot. 
he says, I just grab something and that's the plot. And then I just write sentences. I said, if I wrote a sentence that was two pages long, like Faulkner, you write, my teacher would say, no, no run on sentences. And he goes, no, I just, I just do it. And he says, but the first draft, there's never the same, never, there's not one word on the last draft that there is on the first draft. So I was wondering when you write your hundred word story, how much of it is revision and how many revisions are there? I think every, um, I mean, when you said earlier that you can, it's easy to, you know, dash off a flash fiction story, you can write five, 10, hundred words. That's true. It's really easy to do that, but it's really hard to write a good piece this short. And so when I was using my Rubik's cube me me metaphor for writing a hundred word story, it's endless editing. It's, it's your, your editing, I think more than you're actually drafting. Although I think more and more, I don't like to draw a line between editing and writing because I think you are, it's a continually a writing process, you know, in, in revision, um, Peter Ho Davies has a great book, The Art of Revision. And he, he, he says, you're, you're inhaling and exhaling, you're adding words and you're subtracting words. You know, you're, you're kind of constantly recalibrating a story and trying to find the perfect balance of all the, the narrative elements. And, and it's such a mysterious thing, but yeah, I think, I think no matter if it's a big novel or a hundred word story, that's, it's, it's a similar process, actually. You're probably doing more editing uh, in a hundred word story than you are with like a Moby Dick, but, but you know, at the same time, it's like you're, you're, I think writers are always going through these different parts of the story, trying to balance things. I think I, I'm beginning to understand it a little better. It's like when you were saying about your friend and the 150 down to 100. I'm going, well, why not? What's the difference? And then I was thinking about, again, Michelangelo, about the idea of chiseling away everything that isn't the statue. And right. so, so when you go from 150 to 100, this is a tough one. So what do you find that you're taking out? Could you articulate what it is that you feel is not worthy to be in it or is waste product or trash or these are bad words, but something like that. <laughs> there might be a little waste product. And, and sometimes a sentence might be flabby with words or it can be better or more tightly constructed. But essentially, I think you, you are, and going back to Hemingway again and that principle of omission, what you're really doing by taking a story 150 words and taking it down to 100 words is you're making that 100 words tell the same story that the 150 words did and maybe even more beautifully and eloquently because you're using the gaps, the omission, what's not in the story, but you're evoking it and you're putting in hints. And you're ripping that epiphany from its context. You, you know, you're doing all of these things at once. You're creating a poem. I mean, that's why I actually, one of the reasons I'm attracted to flash fiction is it's my way of being a poet. Um, you know, I'm definitely a prose writer and, and definitely focused on storytelling, uh, but I have like poetic interests. And so to write a hundred word story is a type of prose poem to me um and so i think that that's what you're doing so so the 150 word story it's just a different type of storytelling really it's not like it's better or worse but i do think uh, and it is like a body you're searching for the essence so taking that story of 150 words down to 100 you're kind of bringing out the essence in a more intense way i think by that process of, of editing or advising what makes you since you have the novel and you say you write prose um, what makes you, what is it that gives you the spark that says, no, this isn't going to be a hundred words. This is going to be 10,000 or the, no, not even that. It says, no, this isn't, no. Does it start like, okay, this is going to be a hundred words. And then you go, oh no, it's not. Yeah, that it's funny. That rarely happens. And I've talked to so many authors around this and, and I think every writer I've talked to, we kind of have an idea of what length it's going to be like when we set out to tell the story. It's not a logical process. It's really intuitive. And so I, I can sit down and write a hundred word story and I kind of know what that hundred word story is. I, I don't really want to make it into a 20 page story or a 200 story. I've never had that happen to me. And likewise, when I sit down to write a 200 page story, I have no intention of, of bringing it. I, I probably wouldn't be Kaobata in that sense. I wouldn't take my novel and make a, a 14 word or 14 page story out of it. Although I think that's an interesting exercise. But yeah, I think I think there is something about, you know, like I guess it's like an artist, you know, if you've got like a canvas that fills up a whole museum wall, that's one type of painting and you just know that's what you need. 
for your your the storytelling on in your painting but but you can also do it just in the confines of a, a little laptop screen that might be a whole different painting so I think we just you know I, sometimes I think like we train like it did take me to train myself in order to kind of have my brain when we first start actually I'll go back a little bit when we first started 100 word story the literary journal we invited a lot of our friends who published novels and stuff to contribute 100 word stories so that we could kind of get the magazine off the ground and a lot of them uh, accomplished novelists came back and said I can't do that and it was because they hadn't trained their mind for that kind of storytelling and that was the same thing with me when I got my stories down to 150 words I hadn't really trained my mind to write with such compression um, and so sometimes I think it's like uh, a marathon runner versus uh, a sprinter and and writing flash fiction is more akin to doing the sprint writing fast telling the story fast and and writing novels more like the marathon runner and so i just think it's different ways different aptitudes di different ways to see the world and different ways we train ourselves um yeah and i didn't think about that in terms of like slow twitch and fast twitch you have no yeah. choice if you're left-handed you're left-handed and that's it not a pure metaphor doesn't it doesn't totally work with bi biology but i think it it does work in the sense that we can train ourselves for different um you know at different races essentially so what about we've talked about we talked about poems and we talked about what your friend said about jokes and riddles what uh -huh. about like what about like a zen koan yeah i speak you about zen koans in the book and aphorisms and and the different ways that brevity can work with, you know, like a Zen Cohen is more supposed to be almost like that John Cage um, song. It's, more, it's supposed to be evocative. It's supposed to make you think in one, you know, it's a type of riddle. Um, so it's supposed to make you ponder existence in, in a way that you, you might not find the answer or maybe not finding the answer is the answer. Whereas an aphorism is like a little short burst. It's a punch. It's, it's, it's meant to be much more like a, like a witty, it's, you know, a witty kind of definitive statement, you know, so it's interesting that, that you have these two forms of brevity, but they really operate in very different ways and with different purposes and end goals. That reminds me of, I got all these notes I write down. That's when I'm looking down, I'm writing down notes. Um, I like the Zen Cohen's where the student comes to the master and generally the master like slaps him across the face or hits him with a piece of bamboo. Those are my favorite ones. No matter, no matter what he asks, they just hit him. Um, <laughs> But um, you talk about titles and how titles have to do like portmanteau, double duty in flash fiction. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think I think flash fiction offers, you know, like since it's so so brief on the page, you can play with the title sometimes in different ways. And, you know, with 100 word stories, the title isn't technically part of the word count. So sometimes people will use the title to kind of influence the, the actual 100 word text in kind of inventive ways. And. I think also the title, um, it just has a, a different function in a shorter piece because, you know, if you're writing 100 words, 500 words, um, the title in relation to the piece, you know, has, the interplay is, is much more, I guess, pr prominent or noticeable, you know, whereas the title of a novel, you, in the, you can get so immersed in the novel by page 100 or 200 or 300 or 400 that you're almost kind of forgetting how the title is is a part of the book. Um, whereas like the title of a, a short piece is just a vital part of the book, like like the Red Wheel, Wheelbarrow that you, you read earlier. You know, the title never goes away, right? It's always part of your reading experience. And I think it has that function of flash fiction too. It's like Marshall McLuhan's The Medium is the Massage. It's like, now that I think about it, why am I thinking your book is about flash fiction? It's the art of brevity. It has nothing to do with flash fiction. I mean, well, it, flash fiction is the main um, yeah. what, what I'm communicating. But, but you're right. I, I, I wrote the book to be a meditation on brevity in general. And that's why I bring in like visual arts and, and, and music and other, other forms. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the one... We were talking briefly about plot, and you did that one thing. Was it E.M. Forrester who said the king died, the queen died, and then the king died, the queen died of grief? Right. One is one has no plot, the other one does. Amplify on that a little bit because that's very important. 
It is. I get asked a lot, like, can you actually have a plot in a hundred word story and a plot defined as there being a beginning, a middle and an end, or another way to define a plot or a story is that there's character change. And, uh, you know, I've, I read thousands of hundred word stories for our, our journal and 99.5% of them have a plot. They have a beginning, middle, and end, and a character goes through a noticeable change. A character faces a conflict and ch it changes because of their, their need or desire and the obstacle between them and their desire. So that's really interesting, but it's a different type of plotting. And my title for the chapter is Plotting, but with a slant. And that's a reference to Emily Dickinson's um, kind of guiding rule for her poetry is, is tell the truth, but tell it slant. And so I think, I think the plot in the flash fiction works kind of more at a slant or it does with me and uh and what i mean by that is a little bit like what paul paul harding i think was saying is that it's it's just like a less structured less scaffolded plot you know sometimes plot is like explained by like having a roller coaster like you inch it inch it, inch it, inch up to the top and then you steeply drop and it's it's more nuanced i think generally or my stories are um and yeah, it's, it's hard to explain here without without looking at a story and actually showing some examples. But but I think like there, you, you plot is like less. It's it's less the reason why you read flash fiction. Like most novels, you really need that plot to 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 help you get more and more excited about it. But but like I said earlier, like like when I said that like flash fiction was my type of of poetry. I think uh, a, a, a flash fiction piece doesn't need that riveting plot. It's not like a whodunit. You're not going to have a big, big uh, reversal or twist at the end. So it's more about the nuance, I think, of of constructing a story. But then you talk about Philip Marlowe, right? But do I talk about Philip Marlowe? Do you? I can't remember. I don't. Not in this book. But I'm interested in what you have to say about him. <laughs> oh, not Dashiell Hammond either. It's somebody who wrote uh, murder mysteries, but they were really short and short words, like Hemingway. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. I guess I am. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's okay. So we've been talking about the hundred word story. That's your bailiwick. But then in the but you do, and you've said in this interview, you know, short shorts, miniatures, posted fiction, the six word story. So. And then the, the Hemingway one, the one we began with, that has a, a massive plot. The yeah, it does. you're right. How? How? That's a great question. I mean, I think it gets back to um, it's written with mystery. Each one of those words, there's a mission around it, like baby shoes, never worn. Think about the emission, the levels of emission that go into that. And that's where the, the or, or, or even just for sale. Like who decided they're for sale? You know, was there an argument between the husband and the wife? Um, why are they selling them? Do they need money? Are are they selling them out of grief to like forget the baby who died? You know, there's just so many things you can you can you can think about there. And so he's using omission, what's not told in the story, to tell the story. So the the story is not necessarily just about the word on, words on the page. It's about so much more than that. And so I think that that is the big question, though. How does that happen? How is that successful? And it's hard to do, um, whether it's six words or 100 words or 500 words. And I think of the flash fiction, when I said there are a lot of subgenres to it, I think it's like, to use another metaphor, I love metaphors for writing and ways to think about how we write stories, but it's like uh, Russian nesting dolls, right? There's like a, a doll within a doll within a doll within a doll, you know? And, and, and that's the way I think flash fiction is too. You just have so many different subgenres of it. Yeah, and it goes back to my original thesis, which I still don't know whether you actually agree with, which is that what I think the difference between a novel and flash fiction is that the reader is the one who's asked to do more work. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely a big part of it. You know, when I was in uh, getting my MFA, one of the I took this experimental fiction writing class, and Bob Gluck, uh, the professor, one of his assignments was to write a novel in a single page. And for me at the time, when I first received that, I was like, how, 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 you know, and he didn't, he didn't want you to summarize the novel. He didn't want to say this, you, this, thing, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. He wanted us to think about what the essence of the story was, much like Carol Bata. And so, but it was a fascinating exercise as a writer. And what I did is I took um, F. Scott Fitzgerald's notebooks, which I was reading at the time. And it was like, uh, that was a wonderful collage unto itself. 
but I took a lot of my favorite lines. And get, this get, also gets back to what we talked about with Lydia Davis earlier, like that language that is peculiar and arresting for whatever reason. And so I took a lot of like F. Scott Fitzgerald's sentences and, and made them into uh, what I defined as a novel, which was there. And, and in this one page novel, there was a, a sense of like a sweeping narrative arc. You know, there was a sense that you'd read a novel or I like to think there was if I was successful. And so I think like even our, and that, that's what Borges did too. He would, he would use the power of suggestions. He would evoke, but also you have to do, you, you have to trust that the reader is uh is 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 kind of developing the connotations that you put on the page and making the story and that's kind of the fun of it yeah and it's funny like because... the, author, the, the author like whereas in a novel the author is much more dominating the, the author is like really telling the story really like there's less room for you as the reader to kind of fill it out and the other thing you mentioned about uh looking at other authors language or words when you're writing your own thing is that's it. and i'll bring paul back i'm going to send this to paul but the funny thing is that he would say well you know i just read somebody else's stuff and steal it and also it, it took me a long time to realize that writers can steal and they can lie they're allowed to do both it's not like you're plagiarizing it's just like yeah you see this and or you're taking people's words that are saying in public, but you don't have to write your book and write those exact words. You can do whatever you want with them. Absolutely, yeah, that's where your imagination comes in. And you can think about it like we're just in one big jazz orchestra and we're just riffing on different sounds that we hear, you know, and it's like, who owns a sound? You know, no one really owns it. Uh, I mean, when you say it's not plagiarism, it's not plagiarism because you're picking up language and then you're riffing on it and building on it and doing something different. And that's what Lydia Davis did when she finds a peculiar sentence in a spam email. She's taking this little chunk of text and she's like, this is music. And then she's making more music out of it. That's why I like reading Yelp reviews, but I only read one star reviews because... <laughs> These people, first of all, how do they have the time and why do they consider it time well spent? And then it's usually something like the shower head was slightly calcified, one star. <laughs> or I dropped my napkin and the waiter didn't pick it up for three minutes, one star. And I love those are great ways to start all kinds of creative work. Absolutely. I love those stories. And in fact, I, I, you know, I was talking about different containers to write a story, and I mentioned Kim McGowan's Mad Lib. I want, um, because I also like to read those reviews too. I, I wrote a series of reviews of Dan, Dansko clogs. I, I wear Dansko clogs, and for a variety of reasons, I was obsessed by them. But you know, in a customer review of an, of a product like that, it is a story. And a person reveals, it's like a dramatic mo monologue. They're revealing things about themselves in the, in the review. And so that's why I think like there are the, all these places in life where we can find stories and unlikely places. Um, but that's what brevity and flash fiction allows us to do is to draw those stories out. There was a South Park episode where the mom and the two kids are standing by the front door and they're saying, "Hun, come with us. We're going to the park for a walk. And he goes, no, I have to finish this Yelp review. And <laughs> it, it, yeah, and it's like, you know, look at those people. They're writing a, a lot of words. And it's kind of, it is a creative act. But... Absolutely. Sean Lovelace, who's a great flash fiction writer, um, he, uh, he found himself in life writing complaint letters. And then he realized that the complaint letters, which is a type of Yelp review, right? That they were stories. And so he he published a lot of, he wrote complaint letters as stories and he'd write these outrageous, crazy, you know, complaint letters, you know? Um, but it's a way to tell the story of life. You may not be old enough, but there was, remember Father Guido Sarducci on Saturday Night Live? He yeah, wrote, sure. He wrote, he wrote the Laszlo letters, which was a series of complaints and letters to companies that actually wrote back. Um, you know, yeah, like uh, what's his face, uh, Ali G. You know what it was. You know, right? Yeah, I'd forgotten uh, that. But... Yeah, and people would actually talk to him. That's another way of looking at flash fiction. Is you know, you could look at it. No, you can't. I was thinking of impersonation. It's not that. It could be an impersonation. Uh -huh. it just depends on whether you. 
believe if you have a creed if you feel it has credence well now i'm rambling again so we have to end once i get like this <laughs> so i <laughs> anyway yeah thank you so much this was great and i really did learn a lot in the book and um yeah oh great. And I, was thinking, I was thinking um we have all these book clubs and this is a great book for the i don't know whether it'd be the nonfiction book club it, that was okay. My last question: Have you ever considered the idea of flash nonfiction? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, really? I love. I love. We actually publish uh, nonfiction essays in a hundred word story, so you can write a hundred word essay, and uh, I, I'll guide your listeners to Brevity Magazine, which is um, essays, nonfiction essays that are seven hundred fifty words or less. And so, I think the form works really well uh, for nonfiction as well. And when I talk about storytelling, I'm including nonfiction. I think everything is a story. Oh, um, cool. and, and I'm going to give you this challenge, Sam, since you you gave you, you brought out so many great story prompts in this. Um, so take some of those Yelp reviews, uh, whether it's about, I think, what somebody dropping the napkin and the waiter not picking it up. Uh, the one before that was really good. What was that one? calcification <laughs> the shower head was slightly calcified oh yeah the shower head's calcified what a beautiful uh beginning of a story uh because think about all the story that's behind that one complaint uh so i want you to write those two stories and see all right. and write them in flash pieces and see where you get i'll send them to you yeah well, thank you. thanks so much grant this was a pleasure i really like i said i you know i'm you're supposed to say this stuff, but I really did learn a lot because I came into it not really knowing what it was and the formats it could take. And, and like you said, quoting other people in the book made such a great difference and you picked the right people to talk about. Or oh, great. Talk about. Yeah. yeah, let me know if you write those stories. I want to read them. Okay, thanks a lot.